Our next speaker is Veronica Bourdian. Veronica is a product and type designer running the international indie foundry Type Together with partner Jose Scalione. Since 2006, <laughs> she is one of the organizers of the Alphabet's membership program, co-chairwoman of Grand Chan Project, co-curator, organizer of Type Tech Meetup, and guest lecturer of the Faculty of Architecture and Design, NTNU, in Norway. Please welcome Veronica. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the whole Musk, 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 sorry, Musk, Musk team. Um, it has been a wonderful day, really packed. It's amazing work what you guys are doing. Uh, I feel a little bit out of space, out of out of place. <laughs> I've never designed um, an Arabic type. That's actually something that Aza is doing within the team. So I will be speaking a little bit about my experience running a foundry, let's say. Uh, first, and it's actually my first time in Beirut. Um, quite a sensory <laughs> experience, but really great. I, I'm based in Spain, so, you know, I love the Mediterranean. This is, this is really great. First, um, just a little bit of a historical context, let's say. Uh, how did we get here? Very condensed uh, historical. So, you know, Gutenberg, of course, industrial between Gutenberg and the Industrial Revolution, the type making was, was basically a trade. It was really tough, tough work. Um, and composing type and printing required a lot of manual skill, artisanship, which it still does, but uh, then with the Industrial Revolution, things changed. Um, inventing, you know, with the invention of the steam press, the pantograph, linotype, monotype, and the like, and all these machines, it was a major shift in, in gears and also an economic drive that demanded different goods, produced faster, cheaply, and so on. And in a way, we still call it an industry, although it's not really that much of an industry. And then with the brief layover in photo composition, we arrive, of course, at the kind of next big digital revolution, the digital typography, where, where I just um, here is mentioned the, the postscript. And perhaps some of you, probably not, I'm not sure. Yes, some, okay. <laughs> yes, remember these kind of uh, funny black and white icons. So... You know, in a way, um, back then, freehand was today a sort of illustrator. And they were giving away this this copy of Fontographer, which is a precursor of glyphs. Yeah, <laughs> you could say. Um, it was the first sort of font making tool. And in a way, it started the democratization of, of type making. And kind of now pretty much everyone who had time could do a typeface. And according to Matthew Carter, who was one of the major kind of type designers you might know, everyone really did design a typeface in the 90s. So all these kind of new fonts and the design in general saw really an attempt to break away from the rules, the dogmas, from the past, from the Bauhaus, from all the kind of straight and rigid stuff, which is not quite new as a as a movement or because you always have these sort of movement a counter movement a reaction and and um in that way also a a, a progression of things and within the design community the spareheading was really emigre i'm not sure if you are familiar with it <clears throat> but um susanna lichko one of the very, very, very few women who designed um, typefaces. She she was the, the major kind of inspiration. She's behind that together with Rudy Wanderlands. And they were doing these incredible kind of very unusual uh, designs. As well, of course, Fuse um, and uh, Blur, Neville Brody and those guys. Even Gerard Unger, who was my mentor in Reading. He did some experimental things. And, you know, in the 90s kind of saw this sort of stuff happening. 
but not everyone was was very happy with with this um and people like stephen heller um kind of called the cult of the ugly which in a way i believe is coming back now but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna judge um and there were people like massimo vignelli and and super kind of old style guy um who advocated for his infamous six font credo that basically these are the fonts you need and not not more even in 2006 he was talking about this so in a way you know despite some exceptions um the 90s did not produce really long lasting results in a way but it was amazing for experimentation and it allowed designers to to really easily play with type in in this way that was not bef what was not possible before and technology changed but big companies like monotype land type they did not quite catch up with it and so there was not enough quality designers um until kind of reading and then Hague, these two schools in Europe um, came, came up with master programs in, in type design. And it was really the time to kind of take advantage of this democratization of typographic tools. But it also had to happen with an understanding of the typographic richness and, and heritage and the cultures that we all have. So this is me and Jose, a bit young, like, 20 years ago, no gray hair. Um, and, you know, even although the schools were were in Europe, uh, it brought together a lot of people from all over the world. It's actually Nadine Shaheen was my my um, colleague in a, in a class and many other people. And so so this had a very cosmopolitan character. You know, it, it really promoted this kind of fusion, blending, hybridization in type design as well. And it was, it was wonderful. It really opened a world to me. And indeed, the timing could not have been better because in the early 2000, um, it kind of coincided with the introduction of OpenType, the extension of Unicode, the Internet became more of a thing um, that really changed the, the commerce, the way we communicate. Um, and later on web fonts, variable fonts, and so on now. So in 2006, me and Jose, um, we started type together at a distance. We never, and until now, never had, um, offices. We don't have a representative bureau, studio, pretty, with pretty things. Um, he is based in Argentina and I was back then when we started in the US since then moved moved around a little bit but what was quite unusual was really this this collaboration over distance and on one typeface um, so Camina was one of our first kind of truly joint joint um, designs where we also deliberately focused uh, from the beginning on editorial design so on really body copy no display shit we we were not interested in that and there were very few indie foundries back then and in and, and, and with that and that's why it's also called type together because we did not want to do just our own thing we wanted to kind of create um or build a community and the, the, the idea was really to, to bring uh, like-minded people together in the hope to, to create this kind of synergy and to learn from each other. So we publish from, from other designers, we collaborate a lot with people, with different people. And, you know, um, with so many kind of different backgrounds and, and getting together, although English is our main language, each of us, has very clear ideas and, and backgrounds and kind of different cultures. So uh, one first thing that was important to us was, was accents. I mean, you might think that it's it's sort of, well, yeah, okay. But um, it was never an afterthought. In Czech, that's where I'm originally from, Czech Republic, we have 15 of those things. And I mean, you can read sort of without the accents, but the, the, um, the, yeah, the, the, the meaning can, can change. 
So we wanted to make sure to to have this as, uh, you know, to create as as best and legible and culturally appropriate. That was the main thing. Because back, you need to remember really back um, kind of 16, 17 years ago, a lot of the funds, even back then, that came out from major foundries, they had to be re-engineered in the Eastern Bloc because it was impossible to use. There there were people making money out of that in in the East. So looking back, this was probably one of our first goals to really kind of typography reaching across boundaries and to be respectful and of, of local and regional cultural heritage. And that kind of um, went further into pan-European sets. So, so we included um, Greek and Cyrillic working with, with people from the region. Um, I did bits, my, my kind of bit of, of Cyrillic and, and Greek but always in in the understanding that it's not your own script that you really have to dig in. So diversity was and is really important to us, be it inside the team, within our interests, involvements, but also our projects and clients. We, we kind of try to embrace these, these differences and believe that it really brings personal growth and therefore also better solutions, design solutions. So we have a rather diverse team. This is three years ago. It's, it, I, I call it a, a, a small global team. This is two years ago. So it's changing a little bit. But you see a lot of women. It's great. I, at the beginning, it was basically just poor Jose, one guy. He had to fight with all us. And this is the last one. Um, and so that's why I call it a global company because we really only once a year come together um, physically. Otherwise we see each other every week or I mean online. So when the pan- pandemic hit, we were like, yeah, okay, whatever, <laughs> you know, just continue. So, and, and also it's important to kind of show and really celebrate the people behind, behind the work. So that was always important to us. Um, to, to really um, give value through that, to show the, the users, the customers, hey, this is a person behind that. And the main advantage of, of kind of this fruitful collaboration is that really results in, in some kind of creative energy, synergy. Yeah, you, you, of course, when you collaborate with people, you have these different influences. And in the end, the, the result becomes more than the sum of the parts. So one of the results is, is the book, uh, Building Ligatures, yeah. um, where we kind of decided sort of as a celebration of our 15 year um, existence to, to make this book. It was supposed to be a little booklet. And in the end, it, of course, um, ended up like 250 pages um, that we, we tried to build up on our experiences and, and focus, well, of the past kind of years, um, focus on, on different aspects um, of the work we do, multi-script phases, educational articles, some kind of technology, curiosity, and, and so on. And, and we wanted to really capture and condense these different spheres we are interested in. So this is a bit of a, the book is like a, like a snapshot, let's say. A tangible object so we really wanted to have an object and we uh, also in there worked um, collaborated asked people friends and colleagues to to write and kind of a part of our philosophy i call it good karma is also for example um we developed a, a crediting model so even we did that about five years ago um we presented that at a type pi because even at that time you know, mostly uh, even smaller foundries or medium sized foundries and certainly the big ones, they would not credit the, the designer really. Yeah? They would just say the monotype team. And there were like 20 people working it, you know, in different in different uh, capacities. So we, we tried to to set up a model that we now adhere. And I, I'm happy to say that other people, other foundries kind of started also crediting more. But also we um we we kind of work no sorry this is this is later on um 
a little what I like a little story is that apparently many millennia ago uh, when there were many different types of humans they kind of coexisted language and the ability to tell stories to describe concepts and things that are not there that you can't really see and according to some theories to gossip is what massively advanced prehistoric homo sapiens and initiated a cognitive revolution that continues today. I kind of like this theory, you know, that gossip actually brought us to, to these intelligent or sometimes not so intelligent, um, if you look at politics. Anyway, um, so what, what, what is nice is that we, we are connected to these kind of stories. We like stories, no? And, and so I always felt that communication with our users, with our, with the people who who work with our funds is, is important, and also kind of inter collaboration uh, with other industries, relevant industries. So what we focus on is kind of building value, emotional connections, and and stories in addition to our base business of creating typefaces, to really um, help kind of users understand what. The work what work lies behind projects and um, so for example like um, quality font quality guides or licensing guide and the we did an anatomy series series of uh, different scripts so the Chinese the Arabic the Devanagari that does not necessarily exist we do interviews and so on and we also collaborate with educational institutions like the AUB and uh, this one i'm i'm really flabbergasted you guys in two weeks what wonderful works they did with our typefaces uh and i have now the honor to say so we have noor kadur <laughs> zanabu hamdan <laughs> and zaina husari really great stuff and so to continue a little bit in our supporting initiatives because we do th believe that education is important we have a scholarship uh, in the end f four years ago when Khad passed we renamed it in his honor and the idea is um, really to mentor uh, a design student to finish their, their project they also receive some money and um, of course a publishing contract with type together so this is one that just came out uh, Anya Danielova from uh, from Russia but uh, living in the Netherlands uh, that's Rezak and this is from Nina Faulhaber from Germany she's working on that one aeroplan probably gonna be next year and this one is Plokin um, by Emma Marichal, a French, who has this really huge kind of project. Um, let's see how much she'll, she'll manage. But it has been great really to come into contact with uh, and mentor all these, all these young, young people who have an enthusiasm that sometimes I probably lack after like to being in this thing 20 years. <laughs> anyway. So there has been this this clear shift from from paper to digital, um, but they they kind of coexist in a in a hybrid environment, and even you know studies show that paper is still the the preferred medium for long texts, especially informative complex texts, but uh, of course plenty of other kind of content, short vernacular happens mostly on screen today. Everybody is with this thing, right? And, and the trend goes even further um, into even immersive design. So be kind of completely surrounded by it. What I want to say with this is that society habits and, and also the media, digital media, they will be, they will continue to be driving forces for, for design, for type design, the type makers, for, you know, for the profession. Like, for example, today, um, as, a, as a graphic designer, or even as a type designer, you basically have to be a coder. I, that's at least my, my feeling, to have an edge. 
And um, so there is more focus on, on type for digital reading, for these kind of shorter attention spans, for greater need of expression. And um, so in a way, you as a, or one as a, as a designer, as a foundry especially, you have to analyze these needs, kind of respond to them, changes in, in these communications, kind of adapt, keep your eyes open. And in 2006, um, we, we kind of said, okay, of course, a type design should not happen in a vacuum. So we developed this, this project, uh, Portada, that started as a custom fund for an Argentinian uh, newspaper. But um, it was really our reaction f to all of these sans serif fonts on screen. So because we said, okay, this is a, a serif, this is going to work on screen, it's going to be really developed for, for screen usage. And, um, and in to be used in kind of destructive, rather destructive digital environments. And so that's why we kind of set out um, to, to design that. And actually, um, as part of our, let's say, more global outlook, um, we, we have a time, uh, Sahara Afshar, the Arabic, and um, we have a Cyrillic and probably, and, and also in Pan-African extended. So, yeah. Information is is transported <clears throat> via various media, of course, no. So reading is still one of these these many activities in this respect. And the way society and human habits, especially the way we consume this information, we they change, and and that definitely has an effect on typography, on type design. And we really should embrace embrace this new. We should not be afraid. And in, in that way, we kind of set out to um, create a series of multi-script projects and expand some of our families. I'm gonna just show two and because of the obvious reasons, I'm just, I'm gonna show more the Arabic. Um, as I would know way more about the Arabic, but um, so I'm just gonna show a little bit the Adel Sans, which is, um, sorry, it's, uh, it was really kind of started in 2012 as a a grotesque with some kind of humanist appeal and as with um many our our funds is it's a multi multi-purpose with many different styles and from the beginning it was really clear that the idea had to be fitting this digital and screen-based design. Um, this is 2012, so we even created some icons and so on. So in the, the what we like is the so-called hybrid, let's say. In a way, it has a foot in, in early German and English sans serifs, and in the, the other foot in more contemporary centered design. So as a she she managed we believe in a really really well way to kind of grasp that concept and um and transport it into into arabic but we did not um stop at the arabic uh, by now other songs has 12 scripts and we will continue <laughs> um so, I mean, adding language support, it's not just about, you know, it's, it's not just the simple act of matching geometry stroke by stroke, right? You, you need to kind of think about the script, about its, its heritage, about where it's coming from and how it could harmonize within the context, um, find a way of the intention of this time phase and how to how to translate that. Actually, Adele uh, Sans, which is uh, also, it has also a very broad Pan-African set. Um, that was really, really interesting to research in Africa. I mean, the part that uses Latin, uh, which most countries do together with the, with the individual uh, native script, 
there's such a vast you know possibility to research it's a lot new information that even the people from there don't necessarily know how the forms should look like so as i said we we did not quite stop um the bengali is in progress at the moment it's super complex um especially the heavier weights because other songs has these um all the all the way to extra bold black and we're gonna be releasing the hangul in i think in about a month or two that we worked with Chirong from sandal and another project i wanted to show is uh, brie in fact um the 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 um, Nora has uh, wonderfully used Brie, really amazingly in uh, in that, um, which is kind of an upright italic, very display more informal, uh, kind of based on our logo, which developed and this is ages ago, um, and again Sarah um, Aza together with Najla Badran. They were developing the, the Arabic based on, on Ruka, as you all know. And this is just wonderful. It's just visually really beautiful. <laughs> um, and as you know, it's, it's, it's a very flexible and fast style to write. So it has these kind of opportunities for, for alternates, many alternate shapes. And again, with, with Brie, we continued with our uh, extensions and the Devanagari at the moment is in development, it's almost done. And we have some Thai Arabic. Um, and we did um, this funny thing with kind of our exploration to 3D food with Daniel Dalian Evans. Um, there's a little movie I'm gonna play. Whoa. That was that was a lot of fun. Um, I think Danielle she said she yeah yeah she she things were breaking and the drop, you know that into the let into the coffee, that took her so long to actually you know make it really work without breaking and everything it was fun. It was really really nice nice. So just to to finish, um, you know I think. We need to continue also exploring, experimenting, so not to stop. So for example, what's happening with new tech, NFTs, blockchain, is there something, you know, for the, for the type industry? Um, there are NFT funds, I saw nothing that great at the moment, but perhaps it's like in the 90s, you know, just a way of experimentation and perhaps sooner or later there will be erections to something else but there's there's AR VR all the kind of immersive stuff that uh, we as old folks me at least um, will be probably in totally overwhelmed but in the past hundred years there has been this massive development in the type creation the engineering the consumption the exploration so basically, yeah, keep the eyes open and be ready to adapt. And these five, let's say, um, yeah, principles are really the ones that Type Together tries to adhere to, I, I believe in as a person and um, also as a kind of as a company, as a founder, it's, it's key. To, to building a community and a company. And I want to finish with um, James Terrell that I love very much. And this is, I, I want to go there. I, have, I haven't had the opportunity yet. Must be just wonderful to dream. So basically, you know, to say taking a stance by, by simply doing and making and forming and shaping and sensing our environment with respect and solidarity and acting sometimes 
you know, means just stopping for a moment, changing the angles, looking at things in a different way outside of the box, box and kind of dreaming. So, you know, type might not change the world, but um, I do think it can help communicate better, let people communicate better with each other and their environment and therefore also transport and values and understand each other much better. Thank you very much. Shukan.